All right, thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaks, uh, <coughs> speaker is uh, Prem Premsrud, uh talking on RNAi and CRISPR-Cas9 based in vivo models for drug discovery. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, um, and I want to acknowledge the uh, organizers for allowing me to speak today. So what I'm going to tell you is sort of um, a collection of technologies that were spin off out of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where all of this um, development came from years of collaboration between two labs, Scott Lowe's lab and Greg Hannon's lab. So with um, the ever increasing amount of data that we're all constantly producing with genomic sequencing, expression profiling, and many of these data sets that are coming about, um, and also screening, whether it's RNAi screening or now CRISPR screening, we are starting to come up with many, many different candidate gene targets to treat disease, whether it's cancer or many other disease pathogenesis processes. And with that, we can't develop drugs for every single um, candidate gene target that we come up with because it's simply too expensive and it takes too long. But how can we actually come up with a way to understand how these gene targets work in vivo in an animal model and also assess whether or not these gene targets have too many toxicities before we even um, continue on into actually developing a drug compound. And so we look at RNAi as a process where we can actually mimic drug therapy without the actual drug compound. And so as many of you know, RNAi works much where endogenous microRNAs are actually processed into short hairpin RNAs and then further processed on, in the cytoplasm into small interfering RNAs, where they, in a sequence-specific manner, bind a messenger RNA and target that messenger RNA for destruction so that a protein is never actually produced. Now, by actually, through decades of studying this pathway and understanding how it works, we've now been able to use um, synthetic either small interfering RNAs or actually short hairpin RNAs um, and then even further endogenous substrates such as microRNAs to hijack this process and now induce gene silencing of any gene target of interest. And so after many reiterations of the technology, we've gone from using small interfering RNAs, which are transiently um, uh, in transduced into a cell, and every time a cell divides, the signal actually um, is halved. So we've actually then generated uh, stable forms of expression through expression vectors where we can express um, short stem loop shRNAs. But what we learn now is if we actually transfer this um, sequence here into an endogenous substrate, and first we used a modified MIR-30 backbone, and now we've actually come up with an even better backbone, which we call the MIR-E substrate. Just by taking the same sequence and putting it into our uh, new backbone, you can see that we dramatically increase the potency of each of these shRNA sequences. Um, and there have been papers now that have studied many of the first generation libraries and compared them to the second and third, and they've shown again what we show here, that our substrates are um, much more potent, and this is at single copy integration. So what this allows us to do now is have a a mechanism to inhibit gene expression at very low concentrations where we're really reducing the um, off-target effects as well. And so one of the screens that we actually did um, in the laboratory of Scott Lowe's uh, with the collaborator Johannes Suber is we, he created an acute myeloid leukemic stem cell um, and he then infected an SHRN library targeting about uh, 300 genes, and the shRNA library was about 1,000 shRNAs. And what he was doing was a negative selection screen. So he was comparing the cells at the end and actually looking for the shRNAs that were no longer in the population. So those would actually um, indicate and possibly be good drug targets. One of the drug targets he pulled out was a target called BRD4. Um, this is an epigenetic regulator. Luckily, at that same time when we were performing the screen, there was a drug called JQ1 that was generated by Jay Branner's lab, which also targeted BRD4 very potently, and also other family members of the BRD family. Um, but what we showed is once he uh, transplanted this acute myeloid leukemic cell line to, cell, um, to animals, the, the animals would rapidly succumb. But whether they were treated with the drug compound or two independent shRNAs, they showed the same phenotype, that we could rapidly attenuate the disease, um, thus really demonstrating that RNAi does mimic drug therapy, in fact. And if we took a closer look at the acute myeloid cells, you could see that both, whether we treated with the drug 
or shRNAs, we were pushing the cells into terminal differentiation. Once again, uh, highlighting the fact that, drug, that RNAi can mimic drug therapy. And now we've shown this for so many different genes, and we have many, many examples of these that are currently being published right now. So now that we can generate um, and use RNAi, we were wondering how we can use RNAi in vivo. And can we test this to predict toxicities that would happen with gene targeting um, before we even, again, develop a drug compound? So could this allow us to, in an animal, look at many different gene targets and predict toxicities and pinpoint potential po toxicities, identifying whether or not they're reversible or irreversible? So we went ahead and developed a mouse to target BRD4 ubiquitously in the mice. And this, using a TET-inducible system, we could turn the shRNA off and on as we chose. And so once we developed these mice, um, sorry, it's going, okay, we could, uh, the mice rapidly lost weight, and as you can see, they actually lost all of their hair as well once we turned BRD4 off in the adult animal. Um, if we treated them for a long time, they eventually became completely bald. And what we showed was they were actually having this epithelial hyperplasia. Um, but interestingly, if we actually turned BRD4 back on by taking the cells off of doxycycline, the animals rapidly regained their weight and all of their hair came back. And actually, if we took the animals at this time point, we showed no irreversible toxicities whatsoever in these mice. If we took a look further at the gut to actually understand why were they losing weight, what we saw is they were actually losing markers of stem cells. So suppression of BRD4 was actually depleting the stem cells in the intestinal crypts. But once again, when we turned BRD4 back on, all of this was completely reversible. As you can see, the stem cells actually came back in the intestinal crypts, and they actually regenerated all the intestine um, and were uh, fully healthy after this process. But interestingly, most clinical trials are actually designed whereby we're, patients are given the standard of care plus the actual drug. And so we wanted to design a trial, sorry, this is going automatically. We wanted to design a trial in these animals where we would mimic that. They would either get irradiation or chemotherapy in addition to suppression of BRD4 to show whether or not what type of toxicities would have. So if we took, looked at the control animal, you could see that they had some intestinal defects, but by day four, they were starting to regenerate the intestine um, and were fully fine after about two weeks' time. Unfortunately, when we combined chemotherapy with the um, BRD4 suppression, the mice actually could never regenerate their intestine, and they actually succumbed after a few weeks' time. So this suggests that you know, maybe these mice can be uh, used to design clinical trials and show rationale of why maybe introducing new compounds with the standard of care is not exactly the right way to do it. Um, more so, just this year, another group developed two, two new BET um, small molecules that also inhibit BRD4. And they show the exact same phenotype, which I'm not going to go through the data in detail. But again, in these mice, they show the exact same phenotype that we did using BRD4 suppression by shRNAs. Okay. So, now, we wanted to see whether or not we could actually cross these into cancer models and demonstrate that BRD4 is a good target validation in specific cancer models. So how can we generate a model when we need six or more alleles? We know that it would take a lot of crossing an additional two years to actually get this genotype. So this was really too slow for us. We wanted a way where we could generate models very quickly and also have a therapeutic modality using RNAi. And so luckily at that time, CRISPR-Cas9 kind of fell down from the sky, and we were able to incorporate this into our pipeline. And so we all know with CRISPR-Cas9 that you can direct it to the specific genome. And again, unlike RNAi, this is actually now targeting the genome, so it's an irreversible process. Um, but most of the time what will happen is, you know, you will get non-homologous end joining, even if you actually deliver a donor template to it and hoping that you'll get this um, incorporation of this so you can make specific knock-in or knock-out alleles. Uh, if you're making small insertions, it's pretty easy. We can really get about anywhere up to a KB very rapidly. Uh, but anything larger and trying to do up to 10 KB and so forth really requires a lot of effort. And we've seen after picking about 500 clones, we may get one or two that work very well um, and have the correct insertion. Groups have actually tried small molecules to inhibit NHEJ to try to move it over to homology-directed repair. 
But from our experience, what we've actually created now is a, what we call a homology directed repair selection cassette. And so what this does is allow us to select for clones that actually have undergone HDR. How this selection cassette actually works is that it has a truncated pyromycin resistance cassette that is non-functional. We put in between this, and again, this is a circular plasmid, and it only gets transfected transiently into the cells that we're um, working with. And so we put the target sequence of the guide RNA in the middle as well. So it's a dual selection where the Cas9 and the guide, they need to cut the plasmid and recombination needs to occur for the um, cells to then become pure, pure myosin resistant. So in using this in combination with our now standard techniques in embryonic stem cells, we're actually able to increase the efficiency up to 30%. So we only need to select about 20 or so clones and four or five of them are always correctly targeted. So it dramatically increases our rate of producing these animals. So our vision is to actually incorporate both CRISPR-Cas9 and RNA into our mouse model developments. Again, using the CRISPR technology to uh, create disease sensitizing alleles while then having the RNAi component as a way to um, evaluate therapeutic targets. So how we do this is we take our pre-engineered ES cells and then we can sequentially, um, sequentially target them first with CRISPR to insert any sort of gene modification that we would like, any disease sensitizing alleles. We can create some of the, um, recreate some of the standard alleles such as LOX.LOX, CAS, or KRAS, GD12, G12D. Um, and then once we've actually generated these ES cells, we can then target them again with additional SHRNAs to look at different gene targets in the same uh, disease background um, and generate our mice. Okay. So even with these uh, targeting vectors, we're not limited to just uh, integrating SHRNAs. We can actually integrate tandem SHRNAs too to look at combination targets. Um, we have lock stop locks versions where we can make them tissue specific and direct gene silencing in a tissue specific manner. We can incorporate cDNAs as well. And we've actually uh, generated what we call an iCRISPR system where we can inducibly express Cas9 in these animals as well. So the Feng Zhang lab actually created a inducible or conditional CAGS, lock stop locks K9. Cas9 mouse, um, and this is a great mouse that we, we learned of where we can actually then, by in situ delivery of guide RNAs, to, um, deliver these guides to any tissue and then generate specific disease in the animal. And so we've created our own version where we actually incorporate, again, the shRNA, but also a conditional Cas9 as well. And so what we can do is generate these animals and by in situ delivery of guide RNAs, whether through adeno inhalation into the lung or direct injection into the colon and so forth, we can create uh, cancer models using different genetic combinations as well. So it allows us to expand the number of disease models that we have. And then once the tumors have formed, we can simply put these mice on doxycycline and ask to see whether or not uh, these mice actually have any, or these genes actually have any therapeutic value as well. Um, these are some of our flex, what we call our flex vectors now that we are using uh, to generate these both dual RNAi and Cas9 mice. And as you can see, again, we can also do combination tandems in addition to this conditional Cas9 cassette. And so this is what our goal is, is really to take you know, the human genome data that we've seen and now utilize it in such a way where we can generate so many different uh, disease models, mouse models, very rapidly, rather than having to generate these specific um, knock-ins and cross them for many, many generations. And so, again, using this Cas9 RNAi mouse, we can look at and inject many different guide RNAs targeting multiple different genes as well, um, and then look and use these animals to help us inform not only just how these genes function, but also whether or not there's any therapeutic value in new gene targets. Um, and this is sort of a busy slide, uh, kind of highlighting how we're using all of these technologies. I'll just skip it, actually, and uh, really thank my team. Again, Shalin Wang is a wonderful, amazing director who now um, works on all these projects. The team is a great team here. And Christoph Fellman, who is our former CSO, but now he's in the uh, Jennifer Dowden's lab, and so that's of great help as well in terms of advancing our CRISPR-Cas9 systems. Um, our advisors, again, are, um, Scott Lowe, 
who's now at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Johannes Zuber, who's at the IMP, Sang Young Kim, who's at NYU, uh, Luke Dow, who's now at Cornell, and also Greg Hannon, who has now moved to University of Cambridge Cancer Research UK, and then uh, Stephen Elledge, who's at Harvard. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Time for one question. Okay. 